double your pleasure and double your fun. And we're not talking chewing gum. That's this week on Motoring 2002. SN's Motoring 2002 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! You know, when you hear the term niche vehicle, you can be certain of at least two things. One, the vehicle is of limited number, and two, it's going to cost a lot of money. Now, in the old days, when everybody was driving a Ford or Chevy or Chrysler, niche vehicles included Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and Jaguar, at least here in North America. But of course, things have changed. Everywhere you look now, you see Bimmers and Benzes, and even Jaguar, thanks to all that Ford cash, now has an entry-level vehicle. But there's still one company that is considered a niche company, but they would like to broaden their base, and that company is Saab. And despite the fact that Saab is now a member of the General Motors family, a lot of people still consider a Saab, well, a little quirky. Now, people who appreciate Saabs love it, but those bean counters at GM, that's another story. But now Saab is getting aggressive, and they are predicting that in the next few years, they plan to double their sales. We're here this week to find out how. During the Second World War, Saab was producing aircraft for the Swedish defense. Once the war ended, the company needed another product and turned to cars, with the first being the Saab 92, only in green, by the way. Trollhot in Sweden is the home for Saab, and the streets are crowded with Saabs of every vintage. Today, Saab is wholly owned by General Motors and faces new challenges. Our biggest challenge has been to get our voice heard within this very big company because as you know we do maybe about 2,000 cars a year in Canada and GM has a total of us, half a million. So it's overall is very positive and being Swedish, I mean we, we did have our fears obviously, you know, this big company, North American company is coming to take over and we've, we've been just been proving wrong on everything. They're investing more in, in our plants back home and we're hiring more people and volume is going up. So. It's overall a very positive uh, experience, and they're letting us be Saab. Any new product is always important, but this is you know, another key evolution of the 9.5, and we've been very happy with our 9.5 sales this year. This will help us as we go into the next calendar year. Uh, it's almost 50% of our volume, so obviously it's, it's, a, it's hugely important for us. I mean, even if we would double our volume, uh, we will still be niche in this market and uh, we do appeal to people who are looking for something a little bit different and uh, so that's why I think we will continue to try and offer that um, but of course we're trying to get our word out so people will notice us more obviously than we have in the past. Geez, you got to find out where the damn key goes. You go to put the key in the ignition, the ign it's down by the uh, parking brake lever in the floor and uh, sure it's extremely quirky uh, however that becomes an endearing thing and uh, certainly with this new arrow they've got more power in it 250 horsepower a turbocharged four-cylinder and goes like stink this year we, we put more a lot more effort in trying to differentiate the models to models we've really created three flavors one is kind of a very pure what we call pure Swedish kind of functional flavor and that kind of lines up with linear uh, being this kind of pure Swedish functional, uh, the ARC flavor being this classic luxury touring car flavor, and then the Aero was just the all-out pure performance sport flavor. One of the big things though that we've added this year to the chassis has been uh, what we call ESP or Electronic Stability Program, which is essentially a system to help you in extreme uh, driving conditions, be it on ice or snow or wet conditions. We have uh, set up a slalom system 
where we're going to basically set the car in at, at a certain speed, say 45 miles an hour, and we're going to show you with the system off, it's going to be extremely difficult to hold control through that slalom. But if you engage the ESP, what you'll find is that the car will go through uh, a lot faster and will maintain speed and may, more importantly maintain control. The rear end won't step out. The cars we have here, the new 95 Aero and particularly if you stack that up against a, an Audi a A6 or even an, an S6 or a BMW 540 in terms of value for money, performance for, the, for that cost, uh, I challenge anyone to match us in terms of value for money. The most dangerous part of flying? It's got nothing to do with these things. More later on Kenzie's Corner. While it would never be mistaken for a Porsche, the Thunderbird is more than capable of holding its own while delivering a comfortable cruise night ride. You know, the retro thing is hip these days. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at an American icon, or a remake thereof. This is the all-new Ford Thunderbird. <laughs> Behind the bird's stately retro-looking facade lies a state-of-the-art automobile. A 3.9-litre double overhead cam 32-valve V8 that produces 252 horsepower and 267 pounds-feet of torque is a prime example. While it does not use variable valve timing in the bird's application, it's more than up to the job of providing the needed power. Likewise, the 5-speed automatic. It does not feature any sort of do-it-yourself mode, but the car does not lack for it. The reason is that this team works as a team, delivering more than enough performance and a very satisfying drive. It is quiet yet top-down. The exhaust note brings a pleasant growl when you pour the coals on. One of the biggest challenges facing any manufacturer when they decapitate a car is putting the strength back into the chassis. When you take the roof off, if you don't strengthen the body, you end up with something that resembles a wet noodle. When Ford took the Lincoln LS platform, or a derivative thereof, they've strengthened it to the point where this T-Bird is almost devoid of cowl shake. Indeed, you've got to find a very rough road for it to start to flex. In other words, they've done a bang up job. Through the pylons, body roll and understeer are benign, and the response to driver input suitably fast. While it would never be mistaken for a Porsche, the Thunderbird is more than capable of holding its own while delivering a comfortable cruise night ride. You know, when Ford decided to make the T-Bird a convertible, they obviously had their thinking caps on. The soft top is power operated and can be open and closed using one hand. They also gave you a real glass defroster. Now, if that's not good enough for old man winter, you can opt for a hard top, albeit a $5,000 option. You can install this thing in November, leave it on till May, and drive throughout the winter with the security of a tin top. The other thing they did, realizing that most back seats are token, they made this thing a two-seater and gave you quite a lot of trunk space, albeit rather shallow. They really did put it all together very nicely. Stopping power comes from four-wheel disc brakes and a decent anti-lock system. Dropping the anchor at 80k brings a fast halt in just 112 feet. The pedal is easily modulated and thanks to the anti-dive front geometry, it's all well controlled. The ABS also forms the basis for the traction control system. It can apply the brakes to one or both rear wheels as well as reducing engine output to ease the risk of unwanted wheel spin. Slip behind the wheel of the yellow bird and you find a very bright interior. Ahead of the driver there's a classic looking set of gauges and down on the steering wheel you've got the radio functions on the one side and cruise control on the other. Moving across to the left you'll find all of the other power items, locks, windows and mirrors. When you get to the center stack you'll find a six disc CD player and a radio that allows you to tailor the sound to accommodate the fact that the soft top is down. However, where it all falls down, 
this entire block, it could have come from any plain old Ford. Safety wise, the Thunderbird ranks well, bringing second generation front airbags and side seat mounted bags. Thankfully, both on the passenger side can be deactivated to accommodate a rear facing child seat. Finally, the anti theft system uses an electronically coded ignition key with no fewer than 72 quadrillion possible codes. Now, how's an honest thief supposed to make a living with a thing like that? You know, with the trials and tribulations that Ford have had to endure of late, this T-Bird comes as the perfect panacea for those problems. It's got a great engine, it handles wonderfully well, there's no cowl shake, and that hard top option will take you through winter no problem whatsoever. Indeed, this thing's good enough to cast a favourable halo over the entire lineup, And that's just what the doctor ordered. Our Midas tip of the week concerns the use of fuel system additives. Let's have a look at three of the more common ones. Injector cleaner, as the name implies, keeps your fuel injectors working as designed. When the injectors are clean, they deliver a nice fine spray of fuel, which yields the best power, the best fuel economy, and the lowest exhaust emissions. When the injectors get dirty, all three areas suffer. The secondary benefit of using injector cleaner is decarbonizing the combustion chamber of the engine. When an engine gets carboned up, it now requires higher and higher octane fuel to prevent pinging or detonation. You've probably all owned a car like that at one stage of the game. Cleaning out the combustion chambers and decarbonizing them can lower that octane requirement. Gas line antifreeze prevents freeze up in the winter time if you've got moisture in the fuel system. Now how does moisture enter the fuel system? Well for example during our shoot today we've had a light rain falling on and off. If you happen to be fueling up the car right now water could enter the fuel system. I'm sure you've all fueled a car up in a driving snowstorm or driving rainstorm and had that occur. In any case, regular use of gasoline antifreeze can combat that problem. It emulsifies the water and lets it pass through the fuel system without causing rust or breaking you down on the road. And fuel stabilizer is for seasonally used vehicles. For example, if you've got a convertible that's parked in the winter time, a snowmobile, an outboard motor, chainsaw, or any seasonally used vehicle, while it's parked, you should have fuel stabilizer are in the system to prevent the fuel that's still in the carburetor or tank from going bad. That's your Midas tip of the week. I have a 1998 Ford Contour SVT. I'm going on about uh, five years having a car. Each year we've, we just added and added more and more. Um, We've added three video game systems. We have the Nintendo 64, the PlayStation 2, and the, the Sega Dreamcast in, in there. There's uh, five monitors inside the car, as well as a 15-inch uh, flat screen monitor mounted on the trunk lid. I have three kids, um, and they end up, uh, they always end up playing when we're on trips, and uh, my wife even plays, you know. Every time somebody sees it, they ask me where I got it, you know, they want one, you know. The video games and monitor in the ball is powered by a thousand watt inverter that's mounted in the trunk. It's a hobby, it's just like you go fishing, you know. I don't fish, but uh, I do tend to put money into that car, you know. One question mark that has always hung over Saab, but rightly or wrongly, is one of quality. Well, the company recently got good news when J.D. Power ranked the 9.5 sedan and wagon as the best mid-luxury car in the initial quality study, which measures owner-reported problems during the first three months of ownership. And that means that Saab beat out the likes of BMW 5 Series and the Mercedes E-Class. So now, along with safety, the new Saab lineup can brag about quality. All right, now let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, you know a big part of the safety equation is having great brakes on a vehicle. When you've got great brakes, you just drive that vehicle with confidence, knowing that they're always going to be there when you need them. Now, 
On late model vehicles, the last 10 to 15 model years, four-wheel disc brake systems have become pretty popular. There's still the odd vehicle around that has disc brake on the front and drum on the rear, and some people might associate that with an antiquated vehicle, but believe me, that system still works the best in a Canadian winter. It's the least in terms of maintenance. So if you live in uh, an area where you're driving on a lot of gravel roads, you might want to actually look for a system like that. However, we have to deal with these vehicles with the four-wheel disc brakes, and they've brought along a whole host of service problems. Now, interestingly, Saab cars, talking about Saab, they have an interesting feature on their vehicles. If you look on the underbody of a Saab vehicle, and approximately this area right here, you'll notice a splash flap hanging down underneath the body of the car. And what that splash flap does for Saab is deflect a lot of the crud that's thrown up by the front wheels from reaching the rear wheels, and specifically this rear brake system. And it's that crud that's thrown up by the front wheels of a vehicle and billowing around and getting in the rear brake system that in many cases causes the breakdown of that rear disc brake system. This Pontiac Grand Prix, this is my loaner car at the shop that we're using today. This particular type of car is known for lots of problems in its rear disc brake system. But a lot of problems that happen with these cars are concerned with the rear brake caliper which is fairly exposed as you can see here. Now remember that this rear brake caliper, you can see the brake pads here, the outer pad and the inner pad, this rear brake caliper pinches the, squeezes the brake pads together against the rotor. When you step on the brakes in the car you hydraulically squeeze those two pads together against the rotor to, to uh, apply the brakes on this particular wheel. Now some of the problems that can happen with these calipers is uh, problems with the emergency brake cable that's integrated in here. The emergency brake cable is an alternate way of applying the brakes on this wheel for parking or for emergency situations and that's a mechanical application of the rear brake pads. Here's a rear disc brake caliper off a, a car just like that Grand Prix that I had on the hoist. Now, some of the problems that afflict these calipers uh, are, are obvious on this one. This slider right here, which should be able to move back and forth freely no matter how hard I push on it, I can't get that thing to budge. Now, you can get a glimpse of the pads here, and interestingly, the pads are still okay on this vehicle, but everything else has gone wrong with the caliper. Up here, the emergency brake lever, when I push against that, that lever should move forward and it should drive the inner piston out to apply the brakes on this wheel. That also is completely seized and non-functional so our emergency brake system wouldn't work. And if I take the caliper out of the vise you can see that the other slider right here, the boot that protects it from the elements, is charred and burned right off. What's happened here is because this brake caliper was seized on, it's, it's dragged the brakes and caused a lot of heat which has burnt this, this uh, boot right off. That's partially why this one is seized over here. Now if I pick up the rebuilt one that's ready to go on the car and turn it over, you can see that when I just touch that slider right there, it floats back and forth the way it should and that the boots are all nice and new. There's lubricant that's in this cavity to make sure that this stays lubricated and to uh, make a more effective seal with the boots. Now when I put it in the vise and clamp it down, I'll support it a little bit and you can see that when I apply the emergency brake lever, push against it, it moves in the fashion it's supposed to and it drives this piston out which pushes the inner pad in to mechanically apply the brakes on that rear wheel. If you have a vehicle with four-wheel disc brake system, sooner or later you're going to have to deal with rebuilding these rear calipers. Maybe your first brake job will be fairly minor, just pads, maybe machining the rotors, but sooner or later these calipers on m most vehicles with four-wheel disc brakes will have to be rebuilt. Now, it adds up to a fairly costly brake job. For example, a caliper like this rebuilt, $140 to $200 each times two if you have to do both rears, $50 to $70 for a set of rear brake, brake pads, enough to do both rear wheels. The brake rotors, if they have to be replaced, costs can be quite high in those as well, and it depends very much on what type of car you're talking about. There's also a fair bit of labor and sometimes some rear emergency brake cables having to be changed as well. So it all adds up to a fairly costly rear brake job on a car with four-wheel disc brakes. And if you're coming out of a vehicle that had drum brakes on the rear, you're really going to have sticker shock when you get that first major rear brake job done on your four-wheel disc vehicle. But it's something you'll have to deal with sooner or later. That's just the way things are today in, in motor vehicles. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ed Olison down at Power Rebuilders in Oakville for loaning me this caliper, Ed. I've had it for a few weeks, but I'll get it back to you on Monday, okay? Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2002.
time I go to an airport, and for me that's about three times a week, I'm struck by the fact that about half the car traffic near an airport is there all the time. You've got your limo drivers and your taxi drivers and your shuttle bus drivers for the rental car companies and the hotels. These guys know every little secret access road. They know every little inch of the airport. They're all driving like complete lunatics because everybody's in a hurry. But the other half of the traffic, they may have never been to this airport before. They might be businessmen flying in from out of town. Maybe they're landing at night. The airports are completely confusing. I mean, I travel all the time, but every time I go to the Toronto airport, the roads are different. Even I get confused. What's more, these people are probably in a car they've never driven before because it's a rental. They have no idea where the, the radio is or the horn. So you've got half the traffic driving too fast, knowing too much about the area. The other half of the traffic driving too slow because they're scared stiff. It's a really volatile mix. So all I can really say is, if you're driving near an airport, whether you're in that first group, the frequent drivers, or in the second group, the rare drivers, for crying out loud, take it easy. I mean, they say that flying is safer than driving. Maybe this is why. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, whenever you're about to buy a performance car, the first thing you ask about is horsepower. How much does it have? Well, as far as Saab is concerned, horsepower is strictly for cowboys. Now, this new Saab Arrow has 250 horses, the most the company has ever put through those front wheels. But they'll be the first to tell you it's not horsepower that counts, it's low-end torque. Now, this has 258 pounds-feet of torque, but when that turbo kicks in, it goes to over 278. Now, what does that mean in real Real life conditions. When well, you're passing a vehicle doing between 80 and 120 K, you kick down the pedal, the turbo kicks in, gives you the extra boost, you get back in that right lane safely. Now, Saab, of course, is known for all the protection systems to help protect you in the event of an accident, but isn't avoiding one what it's all about? Our first impressions of the new Saab, we like it, but Graham will take a closer look on a future test drive. That's it for now, but we'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. This market segment is continuing to grow. Uh, I know in the Canadian market, for example, it's going to grow about 45%. Uh, so it's going to continue to grow. We think we're coming in at the right time, and uh, it's a very important vehicle. Uh, we can't wait to enter the market and bring the vehicle forward. Uh, we've got a great entry on our hands. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas!